This right here, these. So okay. Yeah, I have some Naipaul right here and some Zadie Smith over there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember having to read Naipaul for school. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, we all did, but actually at the time, I think the first thing I read was Miguel Street by him and it, it was okay. But as I got older, I, I appreciated it more. Okay, I do believe we are live now. Okay, wow. So welcome, welcome back again, Celeste. So I'm so happy to have you back on this Brown Girl Reads. Happy to be back. Uh, we are celebrating Women's Her Story Month, uh, celebrating literature from women and non-binary voices all month long. Mm -hmm. And my name is Anissa Belgrove, also known as author Annabella, and I'll be your host tonight on this Brown Girl Reads. Um, our guest tonight, again, is Ms. Celeste Mohammed, the author of Pleasant View. Pleasant View. Oh, can we see that? There we go. Yes. All right. Um, so many of us have, we have read this, this book, discussed this book. You've been here on the platform before and you're back again. So let us just discuss Dive everything. in, dive in, no holes barred. <laughs> so a little bit about you first. Mm -hmm. So Celeste is a lawyer turned author, a native of Trinidad and Tobago. She graduated from Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts with an MFA in creative writing fiction. Her work has appeared in the New England Review, Lit Mag, Epiphany, The Rumpus, among other places. She's the recipient of a 2018 Penn Robert J. Dow Short Story Prize for Emerging Writers. She was also awarded the 2019 Virginia Woolf Award for Short Fiction and the 2017 John D. Gardner Memorial Prize for Fiction. And she resides in Trinidad and Tobago. Yay. So Celeste, did I leave out any other credentials? No, no. And you know, it really doesn't even matter. <laughs> <laughs> if they want to know, they can go read it on the website. Read it. So, okay. Just make all the, you know, the, the, the gems there. Hmm. So I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about the book. And then hmm. after that, if you could read one of your favorite pieces for us. Sure. Well, Pleasant View, if we, if we, best way to tell you about it is to, sh you know, show you the cover, which you're so familiar with. And Ple Pleasant View is meant to be ironic in the sense, the title and the cover, because people have a certain view of the Caribbean, which is in tune with what you see on the cover. And I have always felt that um, in the diaspora, Caribbean people tend to be viewed as, I would say, blackness, blackness light. You know, we're just, we're very entertaining. We, you know, our music, our culture is a lot of fun, but not really taken that seriously. Right. And that has always troubled me because it's almost as if uh, my problems or the problems of, of that occur where I live are not as important as the problems and the issues that occur elsewhere. And so this, this book was an attempt to say, yes, okay, this is true. It is sun, sea, sand. Yes, that's true. But there's so much more. And there are issues here that, um, that happen everywhere. But um, to get people to kind of sit up and take, take, take them more seriously in a Caribbean context. I agree. I agree. Yeah, we do. Um, the Caribbean islands do come across as having this laser fair lifestyle you know and that we have nothing else to do but just um sun and fun <laughs> yeah 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 all we do is lime all day right lime all day exactly and for those who don't know what liming is liming means <laughs> hanging out yes <laughs> okay so if you don't mind read one of your favorite pieces for us sure i actually um Sometimes it gets tiring reading the same thing over and over again. So I picked a nice new section I've never read before just for you guys. Yay, thank you. Yeah. So it is from the story Loosed, which is uh, the favorite of a lot of people. Um, 
And I'm reading from page 154, if anybody wants to read along. Yes, class, turn to page 154. Yes, class. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when you're there. We're there. Yeah, okay. The CD player remained off. Ruth was driving. Her voice filled the car as she tinkled, tinkled like an overwound ballerina, whirling to her own distorted melody. Declan sat in the passenger seat, taut and still tightening. His mind strummed one chord, the same chord, apology, apology. She owed him an apology for tricking him into attending the service for having the pastor and her friends ambush him, for them crowding him till he couldn't breathe or hitting him on his head or whatever they'd done to get him on the floor like a blasted fool. For the past three years, for everything. So what did you see? Ruth asked, reaching across to squeeze his hand. What? When you were out, what did the Holy Spirit show you? The Apostle John saw the whole book of Revelation. There's no shame in it. You can tell me. Declan withdrew his hand, gripped his knee. But some people don't see anything, she continued. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that tonight you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. When you were on the floor and I was holding you and Bishop asked, I heard you say yes. Things will be different for us now, Deck. You're a new man now. The high green walls and electronic gate of Hibiscus Park came into view about 50 feet ahead. Ordinarily, Declan would have picked up the gate remote by now, 40 feet. He would have pressed it by now, 30 feet. But this time he said, stop, stop, stop. Ruth mashed down on the brakes, looking worried. Pull over and park, he said. She did, then leaned toward him. You want to throw up? That happens to some people after. Stabbing the switch for the overhead lights, Declan said. At first, I really thought this was a phase, you know, Michelle. At the sound of her old name, she recoiled into her seat. Yeah, for this conversation, you're Michelle. You can go back to being whoever you want after. Declan felt he was sitting on top of something huge and powerful gripping its reins, trying to restrain it before it trampled them both into the mud. Yet his wife stared at him exactly the way some of his students did in class, uncomprehending, forehead twisted and knotty. And just as he did with them, Declan tried not to doubt himself. I thought it was all about that last loss after we were trying so hard. Maybe you thought God was punishing you. Or maybe you thought if you prayed harder, he would do something for us. I don't know for sure, but did you ever ask? Michelle, I ask you all the time why you're hiding in that church. No. Did you ever ask me how I felt about what happened? Well, I could see you were sad. That's natural. But each time you got over it, went back to normal. I figured that last time would be the same. That's why I thought... You blamed me, and you decided something was wrong with me. You resented me, she said, voice quivering. Come on, he urged through gritted teeth. He didn't want to answer that question, to put himself in the wrong, not when he still had so much righteous steam to vent. Yeah, she said, her features curdling. That's exactly what you said the last time. When I was on the toilet crying my guts out, you said that same thing. Come on, like I was being melodramatic. Declan made a steeple with his fingers. Michelle, you know I was disappointed too. I just meant we could try again. I didn't know what else to... We did, remember? At least I did. I tried again. She looked past Declan as if there was something out there behind him. He had to stop himself from glancing over his shoulder. But anyway, she continued. God knew what he was doing. 
you weren't ready to be a father. You could barely be a husband. That's something. <laughs> no, no, my dear. Thank you so much for reading that piece. And so many things come to mind because in the light of Her Story Month, I think that was a just piece, you know, it well suited. Mm -hmm. Uh, for our conversation tonight. Many things come to mind about the theme of religion, yes. um, grief, loss, mm -hmm. and being, if to coming from a religious standpoint, being unevenly yoked, as they like to say. Yes. And when, when a woman is grieving in this manner, most of us do turn to religion. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So your thoughts on that, um, what it is you think was the breakdown, and, and I hope I'm doing this justice. What, what do you think was the breakdown between Declan and his wife mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in addition to the loss of the children? Um, I will do you one better. I will tell you what inspired this story. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And that will help us to answer your, your question. I got back in touch with a friend that I had not seen for many, many years since high school. Um, I can't remember how she got my number or I got hers or something like that. Right. And we ended up speaking on the phone. And of course, you, we hadn't seen each other in so long. You know, you catch up. And I knew her from high school. And she, you know, we went to primary school together. We went to high school together. And then she went off to university in the US. Mm -hmm. And all through the latter part of high school, she was going out with a particular guy. I knew him too. They were like, you know, high school sweethearts. And so, of course, when we were catching up, I asked about him because I, I knew they got married. Mm -hmm. And then she started to tell me a story that just, it was like mind blowing about how their marriage was on the rocks because she had found religion. She'd found religion and the lifestyle that they used to live before, which is a very party hearty kind of lifestyle. He, he did not want to leave it, you know? Um, and I began, as I was listening to her, I began to ask myself the question, so who is wrong here? Is anybody really wrong? The person that he married, he married her for who she was then and um, they had a good life together. And is he the bad one because he does not want to become a fanatic? Mm -hmm. Is she the bad one because did she just change the rules on him because she found a deeper understanding of, of God? I'm not quite sure who's, who's wrong in this situation. Right. And um, so I listened to her and I began to, you know, ask questions and whatever. And at, at the end of the day, I, I felt she wasn't being fully honest that something must have happened to push her in that direction. She wasn't being fully honest with me. And so when I sat down to write this story, I kind of, that was the part that I sort of fictionalized and um, I kind of filled in the blanks what I thought might, might cause a couple to go in those different directions. And as you rightly said, usually a woman experiencing grief will reach for what, um, something to believe in. Right. Yeah, and, and the, some, in, in many cases, the deepest grief that a woman can or may uh, experience is related to the loss of a child. So yeah. that's how the, the story kind of came to be. Um, but I don't feel like, I personally don't feel, you know, the, the, I wrote this story from Declan's perspective mm -hmm. because I, I, I don't feel like he's to blame either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that sounds like, um, because you're a lawyer, you know, it, uh, in most cases, irreconcilable differences, the court yes. doesn't, yes. but <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we're going to dissolve this because of irreconcilable differences. Diff yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's what you call no fault divorce, actually, you know, it's like nobody's at fault. It's just that we can't, you know, as yeah. you say in Trinidad, make or break. Make or break, yes. yes. A lot of these stories in here, um, I, I notice they, they bring to the forefront issues that women 
and mm-hmm. count. And I really like that. Did was that done purposely? Yeah, of course. Um, well, to some extent, yes. Um, of course, being a woman, I would write about things that concern women. And then, um, you know, when I really sat to pull the collection together, I just felt like, yeah, I'm going to go all in and I'm going to highlight um, a lot of the issues that I see facing women all the time in, in Trinidad. And people say what's interesting, though, is, you know, you can't have yin without yang, right? Mm -hmm. And so what people tend to speak about a lot is, you know, there's misogyny and whatever, and, you know, the issues concerning women. But what very few people realize is that the book is also very much about men. Yes, it is. Yes. There is no misogyny Mm -hmm. without a male perpetrator, Mm -hmm. you know? So every place and every every time that you see uh, a woman being hurt or abused or treated badly in this book i'm also making a comment about the men because right. that's part of the problem that we experience here in trinidad and it's something that i had studied in university a long time ago the, what, they, what they call the marginalized marginalization of men in caribbean societies mm-hmm. you know um they and i, I guess you, you could say the sort of fragility of men in, in our society where you know women mistake horn but men can't men, oh gosh yes and for those who don't know what horn is horn is infidelity it means cheating yes you know so there's almost like a double standard and even I've, I've noticed in 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 the readership um people tend to focus oh my gosh so many bad things are happening to women yes but it's, it's but like, who's it's- doing it Who's yes. doing it? Who's who are doing? Who are, who's perpetrating these acts? So it's a comment as well on the state of manhood in in Trinidad, contemporary Trinidad. That all what you said is packed full with a lot of questions. Go so, ahead, take your time. <laughs> you, uh, so you gave the ma- man and women, both genders, a voice. Um, I like that you wrote from that perspective. Um, you went the middle of the road with that. And um, it would be interesting to know the t- why the choices that Mr. H made, Declan made, um, Judas husband, not, not Judas, yes, Judas yeah, husband. Luther, Luther. Luther, Luther, yes. And then, so we'll start there and then we will talk about the poor young man who was, uh, when Luther went away. Yeah to the children yes yeah a man that influence so i don't want to be long-winded about it but yes i like that you gave these men a voice and what do what are some of the reasons you think that they made the choices mm-hmm. that i feel like um of course uh Patriarchy exists everywhere in the world. I mean, it's just like the inherited way in which societies tend to be set up where men are in a position of ascendancy over women. And it's a strange thing in the Caribbean in that Caribbean women, I find, are expected to be everything. So you're expected to be independent and whatever and, you know, your thing. But at the same time, you're expected to to your husband. Be submissive. You know, yeah. Submissive and, and kowtow to your husband. And I have found like even um, older women, women who have been there, done that, who should know better, their advice to modern women is like myself is always, yes, you get your education, be independent. Yes, yes, yes. But at the same time, remember your husband, you have to, you know. And so there's this sort of tension between what is expected of of us and um i really just wanted to show how much is expected Mm -hmm. i i feel of of caribbean um women how much we expect it to take and bear and um so in doing so i i had to show some of the choices that that men make men like mr h given the strata that he occupies uh, in society 
mm-hmm. he he would automatically assume that you know he's representative of, of patriarchy at the highest level because he's like i'm in control i control everybody i have money right right, right? um so he is acting from a, a position of never having probably ever known any other position but being in authority mm-hmm. so he acts with impunity he'll do whatever he wants you know then you have um people like luther who again i don't really know how i, I know a lot of luthers i think we all know a lot of luthers yes. yeah yes. but i feel like luther wanted to be a good guy but circumstances overtook him yes yeah Yeah. Same thing with Declan. I believe that they, I just really like to assume that at people at people's cause they have a conscience, but sometimes it just gets overridden by by circumstances, and that's and it, that's what's happening here. Yeah, I I think um, with Luther, he was heavily influenced by that. It was the uncle or the cousin. The cousin. Um, yes, I'm trying to remember his name. <laughs> to do a lot of his the nonsense and so he was easily manip- manipulated and in that sense mm-hmm. um and then the children you know the the son i felt so sorry for his son who you know wanted again who yeah. wanted to be who all he wanted was a family and he was he was left to bear the consequences of his father's decisions how i mean again you must know so mm-hmm. many little boys in trinidad end up being the man of the house mm-hmm. at such a at such a young age and being responsible for a mother who is grieving who is resentful um and responsible for younger siblings and you know the reason why i wrote that story and the reason why i, I made it the epilogue is that i wanted there's a five year gap be, mm-hmm. between the story Santa Manity and that story and so mm. i wanted to kind of project the reader's mind forward to think about the future what is going to because you know the children are the future <laughs> i believe the children are the future so what is going to happen if we don't deal with today's problems they are going to manifest in 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 these ways in the future and they are manifesting because The other um thing that led me to to write that story was during the whole ISIS thing. Oh um, my god. Yeah, I did, I don't know if you saw the documentaries there were so many which showed that Trinidad had the highest per capita number of recruits to ISIS in the western hemisphere. And that shook me. I was like why 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 is that happening here? what is it about hair that is causing these boys to want to martyr themselves you know to to become be a, a part of this and just i sometimes when i don't understand something i try to write to try to understand it better right. so that's how that that story came to be that i was just very alarmed by what i saw happening Okay. So so that's how you oh that, that's interesting. I didn't think of it. No, I I didn't think of it from that standpoint. But so that was a uh, what how to say? One of the reasons why you incorporate yeah. into the story then. Mhm. Yes. Mm-hmm. A lot of hidden gems in here. A lot of hidden, <laughs> I realize. Well, um, I my hope is that every there is there are many layers so and there are many things that are kind of hidden and very subtle and my hope is that every time someone rereads pleasant view they will notice something they didn't notice before and that's exactly what happened with me because um when i reread i got deeper into the to the violent the, the violence for, against women the domestic violence and then even violence against um children we have the um the traffic in Port Consuelo oh my gosh i remember last we spoke we spoke about Consuelo and my heart still goes out to Port Consuelo mm-hmm. but i just yeah and then her sisters and how many and it still continues it and this continues 
it just doesn't happen in Trinidad. This, 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 they say COVID is a pandemic. I think that, you know, sex trafficking and the things that are happening to these women and even children, that's a pandemic. Definitely. You know? Definitely. You know, and we've become desensitized to it because like not even long ago, maybe a month ago for the most, I saw another article because they come out all the time. These articles come out all the time. Another article where I can't remember how many 27 Venezuelan women were freed. Frida, hear the word I'm using. Freed. Freed. Yeah, they found them. Um, they were sex trafficked. And so they were freed by the police. So, oh my. yeah. Mm. Miss Ivy. Yes. Miss Every, Ivy. Go ahead. Everyone's favorite, Miss Ivy. Yes. She, to me, was the matriarch of the entire book. Yes. Absolutely right. Yes. She was. So tell me some more about Miss, Miss, Miss Ivy, how she came to be. How did you create her? Right. So you cannot have Trinidad unless you have Tanties. Tanties are everywhere. <laughs> every every village there's a there's a tanti that kind of rules every every um every yeah. home, every home. And I grew up in a home with a whole lot of tanties, you know. Um, so it was in the time that I grew up, everybody who was older than me had to call them auntie. Yes, respect. You know? <laughs> so. Um, I wanted to sort of personify or embody that uh, matriarchal um, environment in which we grew up in, in the time that I grew up, where you have these women who know everything, they advise everybody. Now, their own past will be, most of them, they have a very saucy past. Eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, at some point, you know, they, they too, they find God, they find religion, and they've lived long enough to be able to tell everybody off. They don't have to be afraid. They tell everybody what they think. And um, yeah, so she was just the quintessential Tanti. Yeah, I really did like her character. Um, and she, even when, I liked that you put when Miss Ivy was trying to speak to the young lady about her involvement, with Mr. H because he was relentless with what he was doing to mm -hmm. all of the because mm -hmm. of his past. so I, I, correct me if I'm wrong do you was Miss Ivy jealous of her in some sense because she yes. was being yes yeah. but I, I tried to write that as subtly as I could because yeah. I people never I feel like it's very very rarely that people have one completely selfless motivation for what they do. I feel most times when people act in situations like that, under the guise of giving advice, there is a self-interest at work. You know what I mean? Right. And so I was trying to convey that sort of duality where, yes, she wants to help, mm -hmm. but along with wanting to help, mm -hmm. She also feels uh, um, a little, little bit slighted because it didn't happen for her in the way that she might have thought. Yeah, and the things that she came away with. with now, um, it's interesting. Was it purposeful that everybody, who all these women who were involved with Mr. H, was it purposeful that all of them went mad? <laughs> <laughs> well, Miss, I wouldn't say Miss, uh, Miss Ivy went mad. What happened to her in, in that the thing you're referring to wasn't really madness more th more that something else you know um but I, I don't want to say here for those who probably haven't read but um who wouldn't go mad girl I it's true and, and it's just that um
Oops. Lost, lost you there for a minute. <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It's something. I am so sorry. That's yes. Fine. Well, our apologies for that. Um, I hope we are still connected on uh, on um, Facebook. <laughs> I think so. You think so? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yes, you're you're. Um, yes, you're right. We would go mad because when I why I made reference to going mad, it's because that um towards the end during the 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 week. Mm -hmm. we saw what happened to miss ivy and then mm -hmm. we saw what happened to the young lady when she just said she you know she's like i am not taking this from this man mm -hmm. and she lost it all and she did what she did mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. this is all right and then his daughter she and yeah. all were upset, you know so it's like everybody involved at he is he is toxic masculinity personified mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's who he is and uh, he has the minus touch and anybody he touches any woman, you know, and there are men like that. Yeah. 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 You know, and why, why do you think women gravitate to men like Mr. H? I think sadly, mm -hmm. I think sadly, a lot of women are driven by that whole maternal instinct and wanting to think that they could fix the person that they could fix the person they could save the person like gail she thought she was the special one right she yeah. was special um not realizing that those the uh, men like that no they they nobody is special you know yeah. they're not narcissists Narciss yes yeah and it's unfortunate um we're special up until the consequence mm -hmm. of your actions catch up with you yes yeah absolutely she and was special she was special right up until that night when she told him her news but, huh? mm -hmm. and it was and it's very interesting a woman's mindset too because when she went to the to the store to to confront him to talk to him look at the predicament she found him in yeah and she was willing to forgive just to have Security. Security, exact security. security. But don't so, we see that all the time? Don't we see that all the time? What what people will put up with just to have some sense of financial security or whatever. And in her case, it was more than just financial. What she wanted was a life outside of the ghetto. Yes. And a family. Yes. Yes. The Ides of March. Yes. So, uh, Obia, Voodoo, Santeria, um, yes. Bath, mm -hmm. when losses, losses, when they're struggling to find answers, you know, yeah. and they're with waiting on God or whoever they believe in, they turn to these type of things. Um, what was Miss Ivy trying to accomplish by establishing herself as a card reader? Um. What was she trying? I think again, it was another attempt, and she says so. It was another attempt at wanting to a find out people' business, and b be helpful, be the mm -hmm. matriarch, you know, be helpful and dispense advice. Because if you know, if you come to me and I know what's happening with you, and I also know what's happening with the person you're complaining to me about. I can dispense advice and sort of um, control how things go. A mediator. In uh, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And once again, like you said earlier, it um, also depends on the, what their hidden agendas are. Of course, also, always, yeah. yeah. Um, this book, I, I think, I don't think there's any theme you left untouched. Because we even... <laughs> did you? Because you like you know what I'm coming with next. <laughs> no, no, no. Say say what you're coming with, man. So um LGBTQ. You're right. Ms. Yes. Ms. H's daughter. Mm -hmm. So she's now questioning her sexuality. And um, she ends up in Barbados. She's having this relationship with this other woman, and Mr. H shuns her, mm -hmm. you know, 
the things that she saw as a child at her, um, between her mother and father and what the father had done to Miss Ivy and all that. Um, I like that you incorporated that as well. Mm -hmm. What was the inspiration behind that? Mm -hmm. um, to, okay, so I'll go right back to the beginning of that story, how it came to be. Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like it's one of the stories that is actually misunderstood by, by a lot of people. Um, when I was doing my MFA and having to submit stories and so I, there was one semester where I really was not feeling school and I wasn't feeling like trying very hard. So I had written a kind of comical story about um, a situation that I, I knew well, um, where these two, two women were living in, in like an apartment or whatever, and were pretending to be roommates, but everybody else in the apartment building knew or suspected what was happening, right? So mm -hmm. I'd written a kind of comical take on that. And I handed it in to my teacher and my teachers were like, wait, what? Um, what are you, what are you doing? This is not your normal stuff. It's not insightful. It's not, you know, you're not trying to be serious about the topic or whatever. And they encouraged me, why don't you take, take another look and see if you can, you can do better. Mm -hmm. And so I started to actually go deeper and try to understand why would they pretend? Why mm -hmm. would they pretend that they're roommates? Because everybody knows. I mean, oh gosh, nobody's saying you have to like come out and announce to everybody. But what right. is making, why, why would they pretend? And one, one of them in particular I had in mind and I started thinking about why. And although it started as a story about uh, queerness, I feel like along the way as I worked on it, because that was the one I worked on the most, um, along the way, I realized this story really isn't about queerness. She, she actually doesn't know whether she's queer or not. She's not sure. I, she, I got, yeah. She, she, she doesn't know. And, um, what it is a story about is trauma. Her childhood trauma has made her into a person who doesn't know who she is. Mm -hmm. you know and we don't know I don't think she knows and that is why at the end of the uh, the book she makes the, the sorry of the story she makes the decision that she makes because I think her epiphany moment at the end there on the beach is that I will never know myself mm -hmm. I will never know whether I'm uh gay straight quit what whatever I will never know unless I go back and face my childhood trauma as represented by my father and kind of deal with that and push that out of my, as much as I can, out of my, my way so right. that I can figure out who I am instead of, because she's so taken up in self-hatred, mm -hmm. you know? She yeah. sees her father in herself in so many ways and she's so wrapped up in self-hatred that she cannot love anybody, whether uh, Rachel or otherwise. So for me, the story stopped being about queerness and what makes someone queer, because I don't think that, um, I, I don't think that's for me to prescribe. And I, I also don't think that she knows whether she's queer or not. It's undecided. Yeah, and I did get that feel from the story. Mm -hmm. And another thing that came to mind about the story that Look at the time she, the time frame she had returned home. She had gone home at the father's passing. Mm -hmm. so would you say in her effort to heal, mm -hmm. um, don't you think she'd have some unanswered questions? Yeah, I think she, she, she needs to have a come to Jesus with her father uh, and her mother. She yeah. needed to talk to her mother. Yeah. Um, because it seemed to me like the mother was acquiescing if you want to use that word mm -hmm. or silently encouraging the father in his foolishness mm -hmm. and for a, for a girl for a daughter that kind of that is betrayal yeah and that kind of betrayal from one's mother um 
would also be all of those reasons because you know you learn as a as a woman you learn so much about womanhood from your mother yes yeah you you learn so much your mother and father you know they bring different things to 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 the development of your personality and i think uh, she didn't know who she was because of the parents she had yeah yeah i, th I think there was a, a cocktail of mess <laughs> and but they yeah. were both <laughs> you know caught up in their own miseries that they didn't yes. realize it was destructive again the same pattern we talked about where parents do not think of how things play out in their children so I remember last time we spoke, you said originally there were um, six stories mm -hmm. and, and the last three. Yeah. So how did you come up with the last three to tie in so nicely with the... Uh, there were six and yeah. then um, this, the book actually started with endangered species, which I think is what, the third story now. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Yes. <laughs> so the book actually started with that story being the first, uh, and it the it used to be called the entire book used to call used to be called Endangered Species in its original format as my thesis, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I um, I realized that there were gaps and there were opportunities to make the collection into more than just a linked collection, more like a novel in stories. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote three more. So the prologue was written, um, mm -hmm. the epilogue, mm -hmm. right? Which makes sense. This is the beginning, <laughs> this is the end. And yeah. Santimanity um, was also written during that, that, that time of kind of filling in the the blanks because why i wanted a prologue to sort of set you up for what is to come introduce you to the to trinidad via pleasant view yes. introduce you to the dynamic the dynamics of the place and the, you know the players and so and kind of get you going into what kind of place this is this particular town so i wanted a prologue to kind of grease the wheels and I felt like Santimanity served the purpose of dealing with the ways that we, com with the communal ways of handling grief in Trinidad. And the, the biggest example is, is Carnival and Calypso. Yeah. And, and that is how historically, that is how people of color dealt with um, and sort of had their catharsis every mm -hmm. year you know so i wanted a story that sort of uh dealt with um carnival and calypso and so and i wanted it to be like a communal story where so many of the characters come together and miss ivy's fate is decided and then i wanted to project as i said readers minds forward to the future as a kind of warning mm -hmm. about uh how this is how these issues if left untreated would would play out on children, on children. particularly particularly young boys boys yeah and i see that throughout just that's another theme throughout the um the the book as well because even in endangered species mm -hmm. uh, that young man mm -hmm. with his relationship or lack of relationship with his father mm -hmm. and having to work for another individual <laughs> <laughs> yes um you know so uh, tell me a little bit about um omar omar yeah, yeah. who re recurs in the epilogue you know he, the ep he's yeah he, he shows up in the epilogue as well but and why he shows up again is for that purpose of showing you when these these issues are left untreated, good boys go bad. Go bad, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who would have thought our nice, sweet little Omar from endangered species would end up like that, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I um I wrote White Envelope and Endangered Species shortly <laughs> after I realized that I was with child. 
Mm-hmm. So I was in in school and I realized that I w- was was going to have a baby. And again, as I said, you, you have to just hand in stories. And I'm like, OK, what am I going to write about? And the thing that was on my mind was, of course, I was having a baby. Mm-hmm. So I sat with that in two different ways. Firstly, white envelope, Gail finding out her situation and telling the stage. Right. So that was one way I sat with that piece of uh, personal um, information. And then in the other way, I thought, this is before, you know, before you find out, I thought that I was having a boy. And so I sat down and I I started to like, kind of just think about what is it like to have a boy? I mean, I have a brother, but I never really, he's younger, so I never paid attention really, really to what <laughs> boys go through. Um, so what is it like to raise a boy? And what is it like for boys in this day and age, you know, coming of age in this time? And in, in, in sitting with that, the story of Omar came to be for me. Um, you know, and I, I felt a lot of compassion for him. And I felt very protective over him, but uh, at the end of the day, I had to just let let it play out. Let it play out, yes, yeah, yeah. Because um, he he had a void that needed to be filled as well. Mm-hmm. That that was sad. And then the yeah. money change. Look how look at you mm. know the thievery. <laughs> to yes, call it. yes, yes, yes. Five hundred dollars turned out to be what was it? Two fifty, I think. Half the money is gone. Yes. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. So that, that was that, that was Sunil. That was Sunil. Sunil, um, Sunil and yeah. his friend. Yes. Oh my. Oh gosh. And Sunil, remind me of um, the son when they went for the, the and, and misled Omar in in the endangered species. Yes. 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 Ma, um, the sons. So you had Jagroop, Jagroop, Mr. and Jag- Jagroop's neighbor, the neighbor, uh-huh. and they had their two sons, Manohar and Dev. I think yes. are their names. So I, I think in, those are their names. I changed the names so many times. Um, I can't even remember. So as we're talking about <laughs> me, how, how do you name your characters then? Right. Yeah. So. Um, Message was easy. Uh-huh. I only use the initial because I wanted to convey he is so important that it would be and so well known that it would be libelous for me to put his whole name. Right? Uh-huh. So I was trying to convey that, you know, he had to go by just an initial. Uh-huh. Yeah. He, yeah, he's 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 a big man. Uh-huh. And so that was easy. And then as I begin to formulate and visualize the characters, and um, and as you said, each character is sort of representative in a way of something in Trinidad. I, I try to picture and, and to choose a name, either from somebody I know who has that name and, and fits that description, or just choose a name that I know would immediately convey to you. Because when I say Miss Ivy, Mm-hmm. you are not thinking about a young woman right right you're not instantly you're thinking of a woman of a certain age and you know it's an auntie yeah yeah you know yeah. what I mean um when I say Gail Gail could pretty much be you know any, anybody um mm-hmm. and thing so I just kind of go with how I th- picture the character and what name would suit that person and sometimes I change names quite, you know, quite a lot until I find the one that I feel as the character develops, I might need to change their name. Yeah, 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 I, I, I get that. I, that was very interesting because when I, um, you're, you're saying, you have all these names in the book and I can actually visualize them, <laughs> you know, having the lived experience, I can actually visualize. Yeah. Yes. And so I really did um, really like that. And uh, of course, we, we spoke about the six months, um, you know, with the ground uh, needing a green card and what have you, a lot of people needing, it's a need. It's a, yes. And yeah, people just want a bet, they want a better life. And unfortunately, they go about 
doing certain things to accomplish that mm-hmm. and and it's really sad out of all these stories which one would you say was the most exciting to write um i guess it would have to be santi manity mm-hmm. i really enjoyed i re- really enjoyed writing santi manity and I take every opportunity to say that I had some uh, help in the form of our, one of our former uh, exemplar monarchs of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Myron Bruce, uh-huh. um, also known as Calypso Knight. Um, he, I approached him cold. It's not like I knew him before. It was just, you know, I just some, somebody gave me his number and I was just like, can you help me with this story I'm trying to write? And he's like, what are you trying to do? And I told him. Mm-hmm. that I have these three verses in my head, but I don't feel confident to write them myself. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, tell me what you want to say. So I told him and he wrote the first verse. And then I, he said, oh, I said, yeah, this is great. So um, we worked on the second verse together. And then the final verse, by that time, I felt confident enough to do it myself and not bother him anymore. So, um, so that was a kind of collaborative kind of thing which I enjoyed and um it was fun calypso is always fun fun yeah Yeah. so that that was I would say the one I would pick the easiest story to write you would not believe was actually the first one with Sunil and Consuelo that one was just easy it just came just came yeah yeah just came to me because at the time that Venezuelan situation was so much in the news Mm-hmm. you know uh so I it was easy for me to do research and and read it and I did research for a couple of weeks but in terms of sitting down to write mm-hmm. once I sat down that one came very quickly and I did like a, um, a bit of the historical information that you included mm. about prison the island what's the yes. name of Carrera Carrera Island yeah where yeah. they had I'm, I'm not sure. Is it in operation still or no? Yes, I think- it is. It is. Really? Oh my it gosh. Is. But you need permission to go out, go out there as a civilian and stuff. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. It's and are you working on anything? Yeah, what can we <laughs> Yes, Let- I am. I am working on, on stuff. I, um, last time we spoke, I told you that I was working on some kids' books. Yes. Children's books. I am happy to report that the the two children's books I was working on, they have been accepted for publication. And one of them is due, the first one is supposed to come out next year, um, spring of next year. Mm-hmm. So that they're both about Trinidad, um, educational type. Mm-hmm. And that first one is supposed to be about the steel pan. So, oh. Yeah um so that's that's done and dusted and then I am working on another collection of short stories another novel in stories actually um pretty close to completing the first draft Uh um because you know you have to do the first draft all the way through and then you have to go back and you know so I'm pretty close to completing that first draft and I'm excited about it. I really, I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Here, do tell, do tell. This one is a little different, a lot different in that in, it's still set in Trinidad, but instead of focusing on, it doesn't have the breadth. Uh, Pleasant View is about a place. Yes. And lots of people and introducing you to a community. This uh, collection is a sort of narrowing in on a particular family through several generations. Oh, I like that. Okay, very nice, very nice. So you know what you know what you have to do, right? <laughs> it goes without saying. It just goes without. <laughs> First, I want to say congratulations on the on on the up and coming pieces. We are looking very much forward to to reading. And you know, I'm I'm gonna be bold, Donna. I'm real sorry, but um, I'm inviting Miss Celeste right back here again, and we want to be 
and interviewing you and reading your book that when it comes out again i will happily come back i will have i enjoy my conversations with you guys thank you thank you so um what are you up to for the rest of the the, the week the weekend anything mm. special in terms of well i i had a i had a kind of mini vacation last week so I'm trying to catch up on my work and it means that I'm a little bit behind on where I would like to be with that book that I'm working on uh -huh. so um tomorrow I'll be uh, working and I might work over the weekend just to try to get myself up to where to speed but I kind of work in cycles so I will uh -huh. push push for a while and then I'll take a break and then push and then so I'm really trying to push myself to finish uh, what I think is the last story to complete the first draft. Uh -huh. And then I'm, and then I'm going to take a break for a little bit and clear my head. Okay. Uh, the, you know, I understand the need to take a break, but then the literary community is waiting. <laughs> I just... <laughs> And so. of course, I of course I have to keep my mind really busy because with Pleasant View being um, long listed for the OCM Booker's Prize, you know, it's like, you're like I'm like <laughs> twitching. Yeah. Not, I'm trying not to think about it. Yes, congratulations on that as well. I am. Thank you. I'm. I'm really trying not to think about it and to just let what will be will be. Will be yes. So, and hopefully you get to travel soon because we're looking forward to book signings and in-person book chats. Definitely. Um, I hope you come this way, but if you don't, I will go that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it would be a treat to do a meet and greet. Yes, so. it would be great. It would be great. And I'm really grateful to you guys um, for continuing to support the work and to give me a platform to talk about my book. So, thank you. You did very well. I thank you so much for your contributions to the Caribbean diaspora and her story month. Like I said, this one book was packed filled with so many gems, so many important issues and left with a lot of cliffhangers. And it really makes for great conversation, you know, when we have these types of book chats. So we appreciate you and we look forward to chatting with you again and your forthcoming work. And thank you so much to all of you who joined us tonight. And thank you, Celeste. Thank you ever so much for coming back and chatting with us. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night. Okay.